Episode 3, Part 3. Hashtag Me Too, hashtag Believe Survivors, but what next? To have back together in one space today, um, Pastor Mary Sue Brookshire, um, historian Sharon Block of the University of California at Irvine, and historian Danielle McGuire. Um, and to bring them into the same space to talk to each other about what I think was a very moving, at least for me, a very moving and thought-provoking um, episode. And first, Mary C., let's just start with you. You know, you bravely started it off by telling your own story. And I love the nuance of telling the story of what it means to care for a community of people where all of these um, histories are intersect and the challenges of figuring out what to do next. And I love your advice that we sit still, sit still with it all and deepen our understanding um, what did you gain from sitting still and listening to in episode two? I mean, I mean, part two from these historians. Well, I was immediately reminded of what a long, painful history this is for women. Um, and I was reminded of so many of the, of the other parts of our identity that impact our experiences, um, racial and ethnic identity and socioeconomic status and all those things. And, and I was reminded just in my own life how important it is to be sure I'm listening and sitting with people whose experiences are different from mine. Um, because no matter how hard I try, it can, it can get to be a bit of an echo chamber. Mm. Um, it takes effort to make sure we hear these other stories. And that's why I listened to it more than once. I wanted to hear again and again, these stories that are not part of my daily diet. They don't come across my dinner table. I've got to go looking for them. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just, I was reminded and moved by how important it is to eat a balanced diet as it were, um, <laughs> to, to get out of my own comfort zones and make sure I, especially as a pastor, and listening to other voices um, and remembering other histories. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder if the way, I can't speak to how it looked from other vantage points, but I wonder if the last round of hashtag me too social media activity did enough to mm -hmm. reflect, you know, how, I mean, yes, it disclosed its pervasiveness as Professor McGuire, as Danielle and I discussed, right? Um, it disclosed the pervasiveness, but were we able to see, were those of us who live in segregated communities or in segregated social worlds, which is most of us, really able to see the experience as broadly as it has been lived by women of all backgrounds, right? Well, right. And I would say for me, the answer to that would be no. Like, I, until I sat and really listened to this larger conversation, which is why I think it's so important. I mean, even the people I'm friends with on Facebook, you know, I'm sad to say it's not a terribly diverse group. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I think there's always room for more listening, more questions. And as you ended part two with to remind us that building these relationships and sharing meals together and hearing each other's stories, it's so important. Um, so I just also need to say I was completely like honored and overwhelmed to even be in the company of <laughs> you other women. Like, thanks for letting me crash this awesome party. <laughs> <laughs> Back well, at you. Yeah. Well, I mean, it brings me to the question of, you know, is part of hashtag me too, what's next? This process of learning and deepening our understanding of the history. I mean, what do you think, Sharon? How does it change conversations you have with your students when you let them know this has been going on forever. Right. That's something I spend a lot of time thinking about because lately I've been teaching one of the lectures that I do is on rape in colonial America to a thousand first year students, mostly hmm. 18 year olds. And hmm. so I've spent a lot of time thinking, how do I convey that to students who may not come from the same perspective that I do, that may have really different views on what is rape, may have never thought about rape, and many of them have probably experienced sexual violence in their lives, right? Either themselves or their families. And how do we reach that broad community 
Um, and so thinking about reaching people where they are, starting with where someone comes to the problem, strikes me as part of that breaking bread and having conversations, is trying to meet people where they are and give them a chance to understand both the continuities and the dissimilarities over time. I was struck listening to Danielle talk about the same language being used 100, 150 years yeah. later about minimizing the violence of sexual assault, about the, I mean, she has more evidence and better narratives from victims in many cases, but it struck me that there were so many similarities throughout time in how we talk about this. And I guess for me, when I think about, are we just talking just about sexual violence, where I see the Me Too hashtag movement going in part is expanding to talk about the misogyny and the broader sexism that creates the rape culture that mm -hmm. is part of Me Too. I've been following people who have been doing Me Too STEM who are mm -hmm. talking about sexual harassment, mm -hmm. right? That seeing those connections between what goes on in daily lives to what you might already recognize as profoundly violent moments seems really important to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Danielle, um, and, and how did it <laughs> impact the story you tell to sort of hear the early colonial dimensions, what struck you? Well, I think, it, you know, what's always struck me is just how long of a struggle it's been. And not just how long of a struggle it's been to, for, you know, for women to gain the rights of integrity, but the strategies that have been employed for so long and the movements that have occurred, you know, across time and, and place, um, we have an extraordinary toolbox to access um, as activists, but we've also been working at this for a really long time. So, you know, part of it, uh, the understanding too, is just like, God, will it ever end? Like, right. how do we actually mm -hmm. change the culture when right. the culture is this historic, this embedded, um, rooted in, you know, science and culture and art and history and religion and like it's everywhere. So it's a little overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, and that can make, you know, people feel, I think, uh, less empowered. But again, you got to go back to all these people who've been fighting and all the tools they offer us and, and look to those um, experiences as uh, models of engagement. You know, and I listening, you know, so many things caught me. One was the continuity, um, how much a role race has played in the criminalization of sexual violence, right? I mean, Sharon's mm -hmm. point about, look, the mm -hmm. ones that got charged were black men, you know, who were mm -hmm. accused. Right. Uh, and, and then to hear that right next to Danielle's story, you know, storytelling, her historian's work on you know, for how many black women was the dynamic exactly the opposite? And meanwhile, black men are being criminalized um, around sexual mm -hmm. violence. And, you know, I wonder, first of all, um, was hashtag me too a bit scary for men of color? You know, did this look like yet another wave of white women saying I've been the victim? And, and I realized anew to what extent white women's virtue has been weaponized. Um, as an element of racism. And, but then it takes me to, which is something we've always known, or who are the men we live with and love? Um, who are the men in our community as white women? And what, do, you know, what kind of accountability are we not holding them to? Um, to push it a step further, you know, the question of how will it ever end? Um, you know, last summer, something happened to someone I love who's you know, a younger woman. And it wasn't I didn't rise to the level of the law, right? But it was a wrong. I love that distinction you made, Sharon, that not everything that's a wrong mm -hmm. rises to the level of the law. And I was really, you know, it, it happened in a very progressive space and um, among, you know, people under 18 and people who should have known better. But, um, you know, I was like, really, even there? But then sort of as it sorted itself out, the outcome was entirely different even though a wrong had been committed, the fact that this young person was able to speak for herself, to have a mediation setting where she had two, where it was immediately addressed with a couple of real strong authoritative women allies at her side, um, that she was able to talk about it freely without a sense of shame, everything was different about it. I don't know if we'll ever be able to stop 
violent behavior on the part of um, very flawed human beings with sexual drives. But I do think the change happens when the culture provides a different landing space for men and women who have experienced it. What do you think, Mary Sue? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I don't, I don't think we're ever going to stop it. Um, but I, I do think a key piece too is changing how women feel about themselves. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like a piece of this narrative that, that I hear when I listen to women's stories, right? When they come into my office and they tell me their story, too many of them, too many of us put some blame on ourselves mm -hmm. or think we've bought into this giant lie mm -hmm. that we brought it on ourselves, mm -hmm. that we can't be fully embodied people and not have somehow triggered these events against us. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like at least for the women I know, in the conversations I've had, a big piece of that change, of that healing, has to be in remembering who we are. And I was really struck by the comment from the, the I think it was the African-American women, who talked about themselves and their identity as God's children, mm -hmm. and like having been violated and how that wasn't okay, in part because I'm a child of God. That's who I am. And you can't treat me that way. Right. You can't. Oh, what was that powerful phrase about the, the eye, the clothes and the eyes? Yeah. Talking uh, through my clothes. Right. Talking Danielle? through yeah. my clothes. Right. Right. And I was so struck by that. And I'm, I'm really not, please trust me. I'm not trying to hyper spiritualize any of this. I don't, I don't mean ever for religion to be this band aid. But for me, in my own faith journey, it is a way of helping me discover my sacred worth. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think claiming that sacred worth is a piece of the healing. Uh, I want to draw out something you said, Mary Sue, and connect it to something I was really struck by in Danielle's interview as well. You know, Danielle, it wasn't Reese Taylor, I don't think, but who was it whose pastor told the story on the radio? Uh, Gertrude Perkins. Great. So... It, I mean, you know, so many of us were raised with like something bad happened to you. Be ashamed. Hashtag me too. It's about me. I carry the residue. And her pastor took a completely different approach. Like the shame is not on Gertrude, right? The shame is on. Did he name the assailants on the radio? No, they didn't know their names at the time. Okay. But he, son, he, but he told the story straight out. Help me understand the context. Like how does the faith community get to that space where it's like, this is so not about Gertrude. Gertrude has nothing to be ashamed of. Are you still there? Are you asking Danielle yeah. or Mary Sue? Danielle, oh. I'm asking you. I was, I was waiting for Mary Sue to respond. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad that's your question, Danielle. <laughs> how, um, how do you do it different? Well, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't, I don't occupy that space very often. Um, but I do think that, you know, if we look to the past and part of the way they did it different was just keeping the focus on, um, the people who committed the crime, right? I mean, part of Recy Taylor's um, defenders and Gertrude Perkins' defenders and the women who I've written about and gotten to know, you know, part of the effort was to bring them some kind of legal uh, justice, right? Some kind of recognition that the state uh, needed to protect them and treat them in the same way that it protected and treated uh, women who were white. Um, and give them the same kind of, you know, protection that the state offered to people through the courts. Um, and so part of the way to do that was to focus on the crime and therefore the criminal. So that's one way of, you know, refocusing this. I mean, like, you know, when we talked earlier, when, when you know, I never thought before about how Me Too um, yes. focuses on the survivors and not on the assailants. And I do think we need to turn that around. I, I also think it's important you know, just to find that solidarity because there's, there's, even though there's this, you know, sadness in the realization of the awful solidarity that many of us share as survivors, um, there's also a strength in knowing that you're not alone. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, that conversation was wholly inward um, focused and not on the people who need to change the most. And right. so, 
So I think that that's something that we need to focus more on. One of the ways to do that is by focusing on um, offenders, right? Yeah. 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 And offenders are often members of our families. <laughs> Friends, family members, neighbors, People relatives, we care about. cousins. Absolutely. So what, yeah. hashtag me too. What next is what about you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, uh, there's a line. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a saying that some indigenous women activists use that says, go smudge yourself, which means you need to clean mm. up your act. This isn't about right. me. This isn't about my mess. I'm walking in as much balance and truth as I can. You need to go take care of your business. Um, right. You know, what would that look like in a loving but firm way? You know, have there ever been moments, you know, in history, Sharon, going way back when we can see communities, early American communities, isolating or dealing with someone who has made an offense? Depends how powerful they are in the community. Ah, right. <laughs> Unfortunately, right? I mean, there are plenty of stories of people who go unaccosted for decades, men who have power in communities. Social power translates to sexual power, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's still true today. One of the things that has struck me in the current Me Too movement is how often women, feminist women, have a hard time seeing colleagues or friends or family members who treated them well, yep. believing that they could have treated someone else badly. And that inability, as Mary Sue talked about, to, to get outside yourself, to see things from another perspective, I think is a real issue. At the same time, I've thought a lot about, especially in the academic world, the context of sexual harassment, how do we reintegrate people, mm -hmm. right? It can't yes. just be, you've committed an offense, you are no, forever right. banished, that's however right. temporarily that might appeal. Um, we need to figure out how to make new societal rules, how to bring people back in, how to teach and learn. Um, mm -hmm. My concern is that at the moment, like you're saying, I think women from, it, it seems like osmosis from the cradle are taught that they must that they, their bodies must conform to the world, hmm. right? That they must navigate. I mean, I'll just tell a quick personal story. My 15-year-old daughter flew back cross-country by herself this summer, chose a window seat, which I didn't think twice about, but there was a man in the aisle seat in her row who spent the whole flight being overly friendly to her, and she recognized that this was a problem, wound up afraid to get up to use the bathroom for the whole flight. And at the end of the flight, before, you know, standing in the aisles, he gave her a big hug. Uh. Entirely, right, inappropriate. And you know what? She recognized this because she made up an elaborate story about how she had to run and meet someone and literally ran out of the airport and hid in the car until a family member could get her bags, right? And so I think about this and she's a relatively privileged child and she's certainly been raised by a feminist, but this is the, 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 un, the inability to rend the social cloth that ties us together and the difficulty in recognizing that you are not the one who made the first rip when you react. Feeling that women are responsible because if she hadn't called him out, it wouldn't be a problem is something that I think lots of women and our society still struggle with. Uh, and it, you know, it, it all breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when it's my daughter. Mm -hmm. It breaks my heart for the thousands of girls who are in even worse positions. Mm -hmm. But the idea that we don't have the ability, many of us, to just go about our day without thinking carefully about how we protect our bodily autonomy or try to is just a terrible burden on us and on society. I think about all the time lost, all the things mm -hmm. women could be doing if they didn't have to spend their time trying to make sure that they are not assaulted, abused, or harassed. Well, and so two pathways, and I want to hear Mary Sue weigh in on this too. Two pathways is one, you know, like Daphne, like Professor Brooks, um, the other Professor Brooks was talking about, you know, boosting that sense of, you know, joyful resilience. Mm -hmm. I mean, it won't stand up to the extreme degradation of a rape, but it will, if you have enough sass, it will help you call someone out in public and say, this isn't cool. Thank, no, thank you. <laughs> Go away. You're old. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> you know, like all the things you're not supposed to say because they're, quote, impolite, yeah. you know, or in fact, 
protective. So, you know, just giving young women the right to not mm -hmm. not be tone policed, um, to right. not be told that they're rude. Um, you know, girls who are early violence survivors are often the ones who are branded as difficult. That's what that's how Toronto Burke came to, you know, coin mm -hmm. the phrase. Me too. It was the girl who was acting out at camp. Right. who was the survivor, and she sat down with her, and she realized it was coming from a place of this girl had had to defend herself for a long time, and being aggressive was that way. But then second, hashtag me too, what next? Okay, men, creating a space for you who are not in this conversation. Wish list. Um, we can start with Pastor Mary Sue. We can start with you, Mary Sue. Wish list. What would it look like for men to find their way into this work? in a forgiving way that worked from healing their own woundedness and their own woundingness as the perpetrators or as among the perpetrators, because not all perpetrators are men, certainly. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, that is such a hard question. Um, but I find myself continuing to come back to this idea that we have to build our own like emotional and moral stamina, like internally, like I've got to be able, not only do I have to be able to believe that my colleague who maybe has been nice to me might have been awful to someone else, but I think I've got to then be able to believe I, I can be guilty. I can be a person who did those things and I can do better, right? I, I feel like some men, I don't even know how to say this, Jarena, but like I, I feel like the full weight of all that is being revealed is so much for them. It's just easier to either ignore it or to create a version of themselves that tries to make them the good guy. Mm -hmm. I think we go, I think we go, um, dualism binary really quick on this. Like you're a good guy or you're a bad guy. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to make some room. I think men have to make some room to wrestle with how they have been influenced by all the forces around us too. Because just yeah. like that story of the boy on the bus when I was little, mm -hmm. I guarantee you his life was hell. Mm -hmm. And he was doing what he did to me because the part I left out were the two other boys egging him on. Uh, and I know their names. I know their names too. I know where they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's where those men need to sit down and have some dinners yep. and some conversations. And that's where they are, I think, unfortunately, not as um, experienced, not as equipped as women. I feel like as women, we have more societal supports in building those deep relationships and showing some vulnerability. I don't think men have a lot of support that says, hey, go get your men's group and sit around and share about your feelings. Right. And Except for they make more money than we do. And have I, look, I, yeah. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take paychecks in a heartbeat. I'm not yeah. saying that. They can buy some <laughs> but, support. They can buy some support. They can buy a space. They can, they can, but you know buy. what you can't buy? You know what you can't buy? You can't buy your Courage. sobriety. That's true. Mm -hmm. You can't buy your peace of mind. That's true. Mm -hmm. You can't buy the recovery from yep. the wounding. Yep. Mm -hmm. None of us can. Right. Like right. that you got to earn. That's, no. that's work only you can do. And I have only been able to do the bit of work I've done in this life because of the people who stand around me yeah. and with me and who support me when I need it and who offer me the chance to support them. And I do, I do sometimes feel for men that they do not have the access, the, the same ease of access that I, I feel I enjoy um, when I need to say I hurt, there's a list of people I can call. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there are a lot of men who would even feel permission to say I hurt right. or I hurt someone else. No, and it's like we come back then to the great critique that, um, I mean, it, was, it wasn't a WB Du Bois in Black Reconstruction who talked about how whiteness was the prize that poor folks were given because they were being lied to. They were being told, identify with the ruling classes who are starving you, and you will get to claim all the nobility and privileges of whiteness. Danielle, correct me where I'm getting it wrong. Was it Du Bois? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, he talked about that. And I, and I think, it, you know, you were sort of articulating the thoughts I was just having now and that, you know, in, in much the same way that white people need to take on um, the effort uh, to understand white supremacy and to root it out of their lives, men need to take on the effort of understanding patriarchy mm-hmm. and work to root it out of their lives. And the mm-hmm. same problem white people have um, in getting rid of white supremacy is that they benefit from it, right? Um, and so they might denounce it, um, but they don't want to give up the privilege that comes with it um, and will do so very reluctantly, uh, if at all. And so I think that's part of the difficulty. But I, I do think education can help. I think men can see the world with new eyes if they have the right tools. And, you know, like any person who, like me, for example, when I finally, not finally, but when I first started um, thinking about white supremacy and race and had this sense that I was raced and that there was, you know, this world that was raced and there were structures that were created because of race. Um, like I saw it everywhere and I couldn't ever unsee it once I learned about it. Um, and I think that men can do the same thing with gender, with patriarchy, uh, with misogyny. And once they see it, it's really hard to unsee it. And then they can start doing work with each other the same way that white people need to work with other white people on ending white supremacy and racism. Well, and that and if brings, I could just go add, ahead. oh, no, if no, I could ahead. just add, I think, I think implicit in that is, heterosexuality and heterosexism, mm, right? right? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Think that is the, the enforced heterosexism is very often at the base of these situations and relationships. Yeah. It's not exclusively, of course, but when we say right. men, I mean, I think certainly right. I'm imagining cis heterosexual men, correct? Right, as right. the sort of archetype here. But, and, yeah. but this gets me to Another and as this is a tough one, and Mary Sue, I'm so glad you brought up because that there were two boys egging him on. Because you know, when I was assaulted when I was 13, it wasn't one, it was a group, right? Egging each other on, and you know, so and, and surely, Daniel, that's reflected in all of your history. These are our groups. So, what does it you know, the groups of white men by and large, right? In the most egregious cases, certainly there are individual cases, but the real violent ones in public, this is groups for sport pursuing women. So if this is their social, you know, what are the social patterns? Men do not assault alone and and all perpetrators, right? There are enabling systems and structures, but history and experience show us it's just the dynamic is there to support it as a group event. What does that mean? What has been done to men's sexuality? What have they allowed to be done to them? And they've made, allowed part of themselves to be weaponized so they could not be harmed by other men? I mean, is anyone asking these questions in public? You know, like, can we please ask these questions in public so we can spare our sons from this as well? I know you have a dog in that fight, Mary Sue, you know? What does it mean to go out with a group of boys and have to prove yourself or a group of white men and have to prove your loyalty and not get excluded by using your body as a weapon on the body of a woman. What does that mean, you know? I don't know. I just want I mean, someone to step I mean, in I'll and not say, have to answer it. Go ahead, Sharon. Right. I'll just say, revert to the historical. I mean, what, what I see in the 18th century in the colonial period is groups of men assault sexually, oh, assault socially vulnerable women, right. right? So the most violent, rapes are against Native American women and African American Mm -hmm. women and poor white women. And so, I mean, not to be trite, but this gets back to using sexual power as a marker of social and economic power, right? The power of whiteness, the power of masculinity. Um, At some level, does there need to be a divorce of sex from power? I don't even know, I don't even know where to begin with that on any level. But I, and I agree with you that it, I think that, you know, if we look at a lot of the cases now, um, the women who remain the most vulnerable, same women that you just mentioned, right? Um, right. Native American women, women of color, African American women, poor women, uh, women with different abilities. Um, and so, you know, th- that hasn't changed at all. And in some ways, I think, you know, when we talk about a rape culture, what we're talking about is, uh, a, a national sport yeah. of 
um, sexualizing and objectifying women, particularly um, women on the margins, yeah. right? Um, and so it, it is groups of men. Um, that, there, that doesn't always mean there's a gang rape or something, but, right. but this is a, you know, this is a national pastime. It's, it's in our commercials, it's in our pop culture, it's in our movies, on our TV shows, in our video games. Um, it's everywhere. Well, so crazy idea. it's on social media. I mean, it's everywhere. Social media. But it's also, you know, this is why Mary Sue is the pastor and I failed out of yoga teacher training and why I need to listen to her (laughs) because she's way more compassionate. But this is part of complex personhood, right? I mean, their impulse, there may be, you know, people are flawed and complex, right? And it's not that all men, you know, who participate and find themselves in rape culture are criminals any more than all white people who find themselves empowered by the structures of whiteness um, you know, are criminals. Um, I guess not. I hope not. Um, (laughs) asterisk we'll reflect on that more in season two, but I mean, we're all responsible for undoing it, but here's the point. The talk African-American parents have to have the talk with their sons. You will be out in public. Some officer of the law will stop you. I know you didn't do anything wrong. I need you to conduct yourself in a certain way so you don't get killed. Do white parents or all parents of boy children need to have the talk? You will be with a group of friends. You will be rowdy. You'll be sowing your oats and you will come across someone who has less power. And I need you to be the one that says no, even if it makes you unpopular. Done. Yep. It's like upstander training. And I think that can start... I have a I have an eight year old son and I think it can start even younger and and not necessarily be, you know, about um, sexual assault, but can just be about bullying, too. Right. I mean, right. I always tell my son that he needs to be a a better person. Right. He needs to be stronger. He needs to not, um, you know, fall in with um, humiliating other people and to be kind and generous to kids um, who need who need that. And that's everyone. Right. And that he shouldn't go along with things that make people feel bad about who they are or, or, or anything like that. And so, you know, we have those kinds of conversations and I hope that as he gets older, um, he'll apply those, you know, lessons from earlier years in his behavior, you know, as he becomes a more of a man child. Yeah. <laughs> well, closing well, thoughts. I, Go ahead, Mary Sue. Closing thoughts. Oh, no. Well, I was just going to chime in and say, I even think though those conversations I think are getting perhaps very blissfully more complex because I have 10 year old twins, a boy and a girl, and it's not clear to me yet how their sexual identities are going to emerge. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like I need to be equipping both of them Mm -hmm. for whatever relationships might unfold. And I do think it's just as important to talk to my daughter as it is to my son. Yes. Cause hashtag mean girls is a thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I'm more afraid of how the girls at the elementary school treat each other than I am the boys, to be honest with you. Um, and, and I'm not trying to roll all that into this conversation, no. but I, I do think that how, how we learn to think about ourselves and ourselves in relation to other people, like, what is my obligation to you? I don't know you, you're different from me, but if I'm in a situation and I can tell that you are being harmed, what's my obligation there? Mm -hmm. And for me, I feel like I have one that comes from my faith tradition that I want to inculcate into my children. Mm -hmm. Um, It's bigger than that, of course, but for us, that's where it's grounded, Mm -hmm. right? That's where it's going to be taught. Um, But I, I think that I think this conversation is going to get really interesting because the eight and 10 year olds I know are growing up in a world where it is not so binary mm-hmm. yeah. and the assumptions that we've made, you're right. we're not making, we're not making anymore. You're right. Um, so I was thinking about my son and I think, you know, I want to also have conversations with him about his own body and what happens around other boys and how he uses his body in those relationships. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, that's, um, impo- that's really important. Yeah, that's right. And I, I have a ten. This is, I have a ten-year-old, also a daughter. And it's interesting that you say that, uh, Mary Sue, because what's what I see happening with the ten-year-old girls that 
you know, sort of orbit in the fifth grade um, is them, you know, portraying themselves as being attractive to boys and having a kind of emerging um, sexual identity that is both heterosexual, but also like old in a way that it's, you know, based on, you know, these uh, like tired objective stereotypes of what beauty is and what it looks like. Um, that's modeled on a lot of social media posting and doctored images of women. And, I, and so I, I'm worried that, you know, we're going to be fighting that same fight. Um, and it's harder to fight against now because of, you know, the, all the images that they're bombarded with. Yeah. Yeah. I was a very aware this summer because I had seven uninterrupted weeks with my children 24 hours a day and I survived. Um, <laughs> But, you know, we, we had this awesome sabbatical and we were in Spain and we were on beaches a lot, which was great. But I was very aware of my daughter mm-hmm. recognizing the male gaze mm-hmm. and being under that, you know, like in quotes, right? But the male gaze, because it's always there. Huh. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, and I do think... Go ahead, Sharon. If I can, oh, yeah. I don't think it's accidental that we've ended up on with the male gaze on female bodies, mm-hmm. right? From the talk of Me Too. Um, what strikes me, and I've got older kids, so it is fun to see where their sexualities wind up. Um, <laughs> I'll call you later, Sharon. <laughs> yeah, we can talk. Um, but it is, for me, the message, your body, your choice, is so important as they get sexualized, as authority figures sexualize them and enforce dress codes. Oh, and yes. Judge oh, the dress codes. And evaluate them. Oh. Right. And so, so for me, the idea of, I mean, I may hate what you wear, but it is your body. You choose what you wear and you still have every right to bodily autonomy and really making a space for girls to experiment with their own sexualization of their bodies in ways that are for them that are not for anyone to judge. I mean, I actually think we go wrong when we start policing that is too sexual, that is not what you should be wearing, right? I I kind of take a radical view of you own your body. You own your body and there is no one who can tell you what to do with it except for you. And if there's anything, it just under about being with you all in this last, you know, 45 minutes, it, um, it underscores to me like what we need to do, hashtag me too, what next is make space for a real conversation again, you know, wherever we have a sphere of influence, because if you open the space and you get three grown women in it or four grown women in it, you're going to have a rich, important conversation about child rearing and about history and about democracy and about power. Oh, maybe I'm a poor girl That doesn't bother me at all This is American Beauty. I'm Joanna Brooks. Please stick with us. Subscribe, share, rate, and review today on iTunes. Follow us on Twitter and Insta at underscore Joanna Brooks. Check in at AmericanBeautyPodcast.com. Thanks to Rachel Taylor for sound production, Case Studio for brand design, and to all the women who gave us words from their hearts for this podcast. I used to be an angel now, just like everybody. I used to be